solar wind has arrived spewing its force at, at Earth. We have geomagnetic storm warnings and look at this, look at how far south you'll be able to see auroras. Unbelievable. That's fantastic. That seldom happens. So it's a good chance to look at the skies and have a good look, especially those who are lower than the Great Lakes, for example. You'll be able to have a wonderful view of the auroras. I was lucky enough when I was about 12 years old living in Montreal, Canada, one winter night, I think it was about February, about after midnight, we were coming home from visiting somebody, and unbelievable sight. It's uh, like a flickering rainbow above your head. There's absolutely no sound, but it was so low. Uh, uh, I don't know, it looked low to me, but anyway, it was just fascinatingly beautiful. I will never forget it. Now, looking at space weather, we have solar minimum, but you can even now have beautiful sights of the auroras dancing around the poles, north and south pole, Arctic and Antarctic. Now, the solar wind has arrived. This is what we were talking about a couple of days ago. It's now here. Today, tomorrow, Earth is entering high-speed stream of solar wind. It's flowing from the coronal hole first contacted with a stream caused an outburst of green auroras before daybreak in Alaska, and so far the gaseous material has not caused full-fledged geomagnetic storms, but this could change in the hours ahead. So you have to stay tuned for updates. Geomagnetic storm warning. A large hole in the sun's atmosphere is facing our Earth and is spewing solar wind in our direction. First contact with the gaseous material could take place during the late hours of just now, certainly no later than October 25th, tomorrow. NOAA forecasters say that there's a 40% to 45% chance of a G1 geomagnetic storm when the solar wind arrives. And what is a G1 class geomagnetic storm? We have problems with power systems. We'll have weak power grid fluctuations that can occur. Spacecraft operations, minor impact on satellite operations are also possible. Other systems, migratory animals are affected at this and higher levels. Aurora is commonly visible at high altitudes, northern Michigan and Maine, for example. So the large hole in the sun, as you can see, the picture is pretty big. And uh, we, have, we will have 45 a chance, percent chance of a G1 class storm when this arrives. The hole is properly called, called a coronal hole. It's an old friend. It's been spinning around with the sun for more than four months now, strobing Earth with solar wind at about 60, at, uh, at 26 day intervals, said just about every month. It has previously sparked auroras in the USA as far south as Wisconsin, Michigan, Montana, Wyoming, Idaho, and even Maine. Similar displays could occur this week too if the coronal hole remains some of its, retains some of its old potency. The map from NOAA shows where auroras could be appearing most likely above the green line uh, around uh, the Great, Great Lakes, Maine, Wyoming, the Dakotas, corresponding to the planetary K index of 5. So many people think solar activity vanishes during solar minimum. The coming storm is a counter example. Large holes from the sun's atmosphere during solar minimum because the sun's magnetic field is weak. Streams of solar wind leak out and can ignite auroras on Earth. So we have to stay tuned for sightings. Also lately, green flashes in Hawaii have been imaged. This is where uh, this is a time when green flashes were thought to be fables, but now we know they are real because people have taken pictures of them. On rare occasions when the sun sets into the waves of the sun-warmed sea, the sun's disk disappears with a little luminous pop of green light. Benji Barnes saw it himself October 19th from a beach in Hawaii, in Honolulu, Hawaii. He says, I've been trying for a long time to capture a good green flash, and this was it. It was a bright one. The Pacific is a great place to find green flashes. Temperature gradients in the air 
over the sea surface magnify tiny differences in the atmosphere, refraction of red and green light, creating this green mirage. A little more than a century ago, many people would have scoffed at Barnes' report. The green flash was fiction, they would say. Ironically, it took one of the greatest fiction writers in history to popularize the green flash as a real phenomenon. In 1882, many people read Jules Verne's novel, Le Royant Ver, The Green Ray, a romance about lovers trying to observe a green flash in Scotland, among Jules Verne's large audience, disbelief was therefore suspended. Now people report Le Rayon Vert all the time. And uh, now All Sky Fireball Network. We know that NASA every night has the All Sky cameras going, scanning the skies above the United States for meteoric fireballs. We've had 49 today. Uh, automated software maintained by NASA's meteoroid environment calculates their orbits, their velocity, penetration, depths in Earth's atmosphere, and other characteristics. And the daily results are here on space weather. Now, potentially astro uh, hazardous asteroids. Rocks larger than about 300 feet across that can come closer to Earth. They're supposed to be picked up by NASA. Uh, they don't obviously pick up all of them. It's not possible, but they try to. None of the known PHAs is a collision course with our planet, although astronomers are finding new ones all the time. On October 24, 2019, there were 2018 potentially hazardous asteroids. And the next one that will be coming at us would be uh, tomorrow. It's uh, 4.3 lunar distances away. The size of this is a diameter of about... Uh, 20 meters, which is about 60 feet across. The velocity is 12.9 kilometers per second. After that, we have another one coming in on October 28th at 4.7 lunar distances. That's about 33 feet across. And then we have another one at October 29. That's only 2.9 lunar distances. And it's about 55 meters. That's about 150 feet across. And uh, cosmic rays are now in the atmosphere. We have more cosmic rays bombarding the Earth because we are at a solar minimum, which means that we have less uh, solar activity. And uh, that means that uh, we have more cosmic rays entering our atmosphere, which is, of course, not good. Uh, a new predictive model of aviation radiation called ERAD empirical radiation model for short. They're constantly flying radiation sensors on board airplanes over the U.S. and around the world to collect more than 22,000 GPS tagged radiation measurements. And using this data set, they can predict the dosage on any flight over the U.S. ERAD lets them do something else. Every day they monitor 1,400 flights, crisscrossing the 10 busiest routes in the continental USA including more than 80,000 passengers per day. ERAD calculates the radiation exposure for every single flight. And the hot flight table shows that five charter flights in the highest dosage range, five commercial flights with the highest dosage rates, five commercial flights with near average dosage day. Well, anyway, basically, the higher you go, uh, the more uh, X-ray radiation you'll have, gamma ray radiation you'll have. The um, maximum dose rate during the flight expressed in units of radiation at sea, the maximum altitude of the plane at feet above sea level. And uh, basically, let's say you have a flight that's um, uh, dose rate 15 at sea level, at altitude 21,000 feet. If you go about uh, 42,000 feet, instead of having 15 dose rate at sea level, you have 60. So that's 400% more. The more you go up, it's incrementally a lot more. Then you have stratospheric radiation, space weather balloons once a week. 
the balloons try uh, fly to the stratosphere of California. They're equipped with radiation sensors detecting cosmic rays. And uh, cosmic rays, we know, can seed clouds and trigger lightning, penetrate commercial airplanes. And uh, there are those who link the cosmic rays with cardiac arrhythmias and sudden cardiac death in the general population. So you can understand how very dangerous they are. The latest measurements show that cosmic rays are intensifying with an increase of more than 18% since the year 2015. That's only four or five years ago. 18% in four years increase in cosmic rays. The uh, data shows that uh, it could be because of the uh, lessening magnetic field as well. Now, why are cosmic rays intensifying, they say? The main reason is the sun. Solar storm clouds, such as coronal mass ejections, sweep aside cosmic rays when they pass by the Earth. During solar maximum, CMEs are abundant and cosmic rays are held at bay. But now that we're our solar cycle is swinging towards solar minimum, allowing cosmic rays to return, another reason could be, of course, the weakening of Earth's magnetic field which helps protect us from deep space radiation. If you'd like to join me on my Patreon account, you will hear content not covered by mainstream media. These riveting stories will be based on my research and I will state my opinions and give my personal insight on diverse and controversial subjects and world events, events not covered by mainstream media and not certainly on not supported by YouTube guidelines. So whatever I have on my Patreon, most of those will not be on my YouTube channel. Please consider becoming a member today. More of the, the most significant and important videos will be on my Patreon channel. Your support helps me to continue my research and keeps this YouTube channel alive. And we depend on your support, your generous charity, because we help economically challenged families here in Athens, Greece, and Kapota, and we also help the young generation with university tuition and the community around our church. Thank you.